Hi, I wanted to do a video going over the different approaches taken in the 1990s era x86 processors to deal with the complexities of the x86 instruction set. To start off with, let's go over a quick bit of computer architecture theory. When designing an architecture, there are several different goals you can be striving for. The most common is usually raw performance, which allows you to compute more in a given period of time. We typically use cycles per instruction or CPI as a measure for this. However, in the tech media, it's typically referred to as instructions per cycle or IPC, which is the inverse of CPI. So an IPC of 2 is a CPI of 0.5. Recently, it has become more common to focus on power and area when designing architectures, especially in the embedded and mobile spaces. A power goal is to reduce the energy required for a given operation, and thus the overall energy required by the processor. Area on the other hand is self-explanatory, if you can make the processor smaller, then you can also make the die smaller or fill in the space saved with other circuitry such as AI accelerators, larger caches, etc. Another goal in real-time applications, especially with the emerging fields of cyber-physical systems, is a reduction in latency. This means that the architecture needs to be designed in such a way that decision loops within the data path are minimized. Typically architectures have been moving toward longer processor pipelines to increase clock speeds, but this is a requirement in the opposite direction. For this video however, let's focus on raw performance, since that was the primary goal in the 90s era processor designs. So how do we increase the IPC? One option is to reduce the number of cycles required to complete an instruction. This is usually accomplished with specialized hardware acceleration. A few examples include floating point units, wider ALUs, specialized division hardware, and the shuffle operations introduced with Intel's MMX. Another option is to allow for multiple instructions to be simultaneously in flight. This means that instructions can overlap in execution to better utilize the processor resources. In other words, this is what motivated the idea of pipelining. If a single instruction takes five cycles to execute to completion, but you can have an instruction in each stage of the pipeline, then you can complete one instruction per cycle. The final option is to execute more instructions in parallel. This requires there to be multiple parallel pipelines that can execute instructions and is the main way we have seen performance improvements since the mid-1990s. It should be noted that vector processing is a form of parallel execution and is used in modern GPUs and with the Intel MMX and SSE instructions. Now for some drawbacks. Implementing special function units often requires the introduction of specialized instructions. For example, x86 originally implemented floating point arithmetic using integer instructions, but then needed to introduce the x87 extension to implement the same operations in hardware. Specialized hardware also leads to a larger area requirement and can lead to hardware underutilization. In the x86 floating point example, if you are executing a floating point instruction, then you aren't executing an integer instruction. So one of the pipelines goes and used for that instruction slot. Pipelining on the other hand introduces dependency hazards. This is a case where a given instruction may depend on the result of an instruction executing before it. If the result is not ready by the time it is needed, then the processor needs to stall, effectively pausing execution until the data is ready. Additionally, the theoretical maximum IPC of pipelining is one instruction per cycle. To do better, you must look to superscalar. In general, however, it's impossible to achieve an IPC of one with pipelining alone due to data hazards and branching code. If instructions can be properly scheduled, you can approach the maximum, which is a method that is used with GPUs. But in exchange, they don't always do useful work, for example, during thread divergence. Superscalar has the same hazard issue as pipelining, but even worse since the dependency might be with another instruction in a different pipeline, but in the same stage. This means that operand bypassing is less advantageous in the superscalar case. Furthermore, superscalar places more strain on register files and memory due to multiple parallel instructions. All of those factors combined often lead to pipeline bubbles and hardware underutilization again. The primary solution to solve this problem has been out-of-order execution, which is still superscalar by nature. Another quick note on performance methods. These are more general but will motivate a later section of the video. Aside from optimization specific to processor pipelines, there are a few other methods for generally improving performance. The first is pre-computation. This moves the computation out of the critical path allowing it to be computed in a higher latency, but more efficient manner. In exchange, however, the pre-computation results need to be stored somewhere, which means a memory space requirement and introduction of a bandwidth limitation. An example here is pre-computation of special functions in modern GPUs by saving them to texture lookup tables. In that example, the texture can be computed offline, but now takes up space in the GPU memory and needs to be loaded by the shader at runtime. Another method is to move the computation earlier in the pipeline. This works well when it can be done, but many times it results in a causality violation, 
where you may need a result from pipeline stage 3 for the computation in stage 2. If the dependency is for the same data element or for the same instruction, then moving the computation earlier would be impossible, unless of course you find a way to make the data travel faster than the speed of light. This method does sometimes work for address calculations however, which is something that the original Pentium processors utilized. Another method is to compute multiple options in parallel. Let's say you are building a complementer which needs to take the absolute difference between two numbers. Instead of correcting the sign after the fact, you can compute A minus B and B minus A simultaneously and choose the positive result afterwards. This does result in wasted computation, power, and area though. In the complementer example, two computations are always performed when only one is necessary in the case where negation is not required. Approximation is another method in which case a heuristic is used to perform a computation. This doesn't guarantee that the answer is always correct, but if errors can be tolerated, it could be a viable approach. This is essentially what the H264 codec does for video. And finally, there's the option to guess at the answer. This ties in with approximation, since they both can result in errors. Guessing can involve a heuristic guess of the final answer, or could involve a guess at the inputs and perform the full computation. Branch prediction would be an example of the former, and speculative execution would be an example of the latter. This is not an exhaustive list, and there may be other general methods. But all of the methods listed tie into actual x86 front-end implementations. So far, in the discussion of performance improvement methods, there has been the underlying assumption that the pipeline can be fed with instructions. However, that's a far less trivial problem than it may seem. To understand this, we need to break down a processor into two main parts, the front end and the back end. Looking at the traditional fetch, decode, and execute stages, the front end typically consists of both the fetch and decode stages, while the back end consists of the execute stage. One exception is a processor like the Pentium MMX, which I would claim moves the decode stage, at least partially, into the back end, hence why there is some overlap in the diagram. It really depends on how the decode stage interacts with the execute stage. All of the previous methods apply to both the front and back ends, but the ease of doing so varies greatly. Typically it's easier to optimize the back end for performance, which leads to an imbalance in the front end. In other words, the back end becomes starved. The reasons for this will soon become apparent, especially in the context of x86. Here's an example with the Intel Silvermont architecture. You can see how the block diagram cleanly can be broken down into front end and back end, connected by an instruction queue. Notice, however, that there are many more parallel units in the back end than compared to the front end. For x86, this is to be expected, since a single instruction usually expands to several simpler operations. However, that is not to say that the back end in Silvermont is not front end starved. So now that some background in improving processor performance has been covered, and the importance of the front end, we can look at why x86 front ends are built the way they are and what constraints are imposed upon them. To start off with, x86 is a variable length instruction set architecture. This means that a single instruction can be anywhere from 1 to 16 bytes in length. However, the x86 specification restricts the maximum instruction length to 15 bytes. All instructions can begin with optional prefix bytes. There are typically no more than 4 prefix bytes. The x86-64 extensions, however, add the rex prefix, which can make that 5. These bytes modify some of the instruction behavior by changing the operand size, address size, memory segment, making the operation atomic, or performing repeated operations. An instruction then contains an opcode that can be 1 or 2 bytes long. There are some extensions like AMD's 3D Now, which use 3 byte opcodes, but I am going to ignore those for simplicity. SSE4 also introduced some 3 byte opcodes, but those will also be ignored. Note that a 1 byte opcode is the minimum requirement for an instruction. After the opcode, an instruction may require an additional mod RM byte. This can modify the behavior of the instruction, specify registers to use, or specifies the addressing mode. Every opcode either requires or does not require a mod RM byte, so it can be thought of as part of the opcode. Following the mod RM byte, there's the SIP byte, which may or may not be required by the addressing mode specified by the mod RM byte. The SIP byte specifies the parameters for the more complex addressing modes. Next is the address offset, which can be either 1, 2, or 4 bytes, and is determined by either the opcode, or specified by the mod RM and SIB bytes. Some instructions specify an address offset instead of an immediate value, which does not require a mod RM or SIB byte. And finally, there's the immediate value, which is an operand value encoded directly in the instruction. This can be 1, 2, or 4 bytes, depending on the opcode and operand size mode of the processor. Below the byte layout are a few examples of valid instruction makeups in a pictorial form. You can see that there is a lot of variability in the bytes used, which makes decoding the instructions more challenging. The complexity of the x86 instruction set largely comes from the design of the original 8086 and its successor the 286.
At the time, processors commonly required many cycles for every instruction, and therefore the decoding could be serialized. Here is an example of a state machine, which shows how the decoding could take place. In the worst case scenario of 15 bytes, an instruction could take 15 cycles to decode. With the state machine in mind, you can imagine how it makes sense to add new instructions, addressing modes, and features by simply tacking on states to the machine. Where this begins to break down, however, is with the 386 and newer processors, which tried to reduce the number of cycles per instruction. Somewhat surprisingly, decoding the instruction itself is not that difficult of a task. The most challenging part is actually figuring out where the opcode begins and where the instruction ends. In the state machine example, the opcode starts with the first byte that isn't a prefix, and the instruction ends when you reach the last state. But if you want to decode up to one instruction per cycle, like with the 386 and beyond, then you need to somehow figure out that information in one cycle. In other words, in parallel. In general, however, fully parallel decoding would be too expensive, so a compromise has to be made. There are two main problems that we need to solve. The first is decoding the prefixes and finding the opcode. Well, that isn't a simple task, since there can in principle be any number of prefix bytes. Even though the previous slides showed 0 to 4 bytes, duplicate prefixes are also allowed to pad out and align instructions. This is often accomplished by duplicating segment prefixes. For example, if the instruction uses the default data segment, then you can just pad the instruction with the data segment prefix, which ends up having no effect on the instruction. With that said, really the only sensible method for decoding prefixes is to treat them as independent one-byte instructions that can accumulate a state. What that means is that a processor like the 386 and 486 can only decode one prefix byte per cycle, making prefix bytes rather expensive to use. Once the prefixes are out of the way though, the next byte will be an opcode. This leads to the next problem, figuring out how long the instruction is from the opcode onward. Or more specifically, figuring out where the next instruction begins. Luckily, it turns out that if you make every instruction opcode be one byte, by letting the escape code also be treated as a prefix, then all you need are the opcode, the mod RM byte, and the sib byte. So three bytes starting with the opcode can tell you exactly when the next instruction begins. This is likely why the 386 and 486 had a three byte decoder. Those three bytes also tell you where the offset and immediate values begin and can be fed to another part of the decode stage. So now we have taken that large state machine diagram and broken it down into something simpler. Note that the instruction length points to the start of the next instruction, which could be a prefix. In the best case scenario though, if there are no prefix bytes, then up to one full instruction can be decoded per cycle. But that only works for one instruction. What happens if you want to decode more than one? To think about decoding multiple instructions per cycle, we can start by looking at the original Intel Pentium processor. The Pentium, or P5 architecture, was introduced in 1993 and was a two-way superscalar processor, which means that it needed to decode up to two instructions per cycle. This means that it needs to figure out the length of not just one instruction, but two. Well, the simplest way to do this is to guess. And the simplest guess is to assume that every instruction is one byte long. If the guess is incorrect, then you stall the processor and can correct the guess in the following cycle. Furthermore, this was consistent with the approach taken by the 486, treating each byte as a one byte instruction. The end result was, like the 486, the Pentium could also only decode one prefix byte per cycle. Here's an example of a Pentium decoding sequence for several instructions. The first instruction guest size is shown with a dark cyan bracket on the left, and the second instruction guest size is shown with a dark red bracket on the right. The start position for the queue in the next cycle is shown with an arrow. In the first cycle, guest instruction 0 is pointing to a prefix byte, so only the prefix byte is decoded and everything else is ignored. In the second cycle, guest instruction 0 can be completely decoded because the three bytes required for length determination are at the head of the queue. But the length guess was 1, which is less than the calculated length. Therefore, only the first instruction is decoded in this cycle. In the third cycle, the queue is updated, and now guest instruction 0 can be fully decoded with the length determined, but again, the guess length of 1 is less than the calculated length. So only one instruction is decoded. Finally, in the fourth cycle, since guest instruction 0 is one byte long and the guess was one byte, then both guest instructions can be decoded in this cycle. The length calculation is performed on guest instruction 1, and the queue pointer can be updated accordingly for the next cycle. In this example, the only cycle where two instructions can be decoded in the same cycle was when the first instruction in the queue matched the guess of one byte in length. If we ignore the prefix byte and any constraints by the back end, then the maximum IPC with these four instructions is 1.33. While better than one of a non-superscalar processor, it's still far off from the maximum of two. This leads to the question, how often are x86 instructions longer than one byte? Luckily, easily accessible data exists, which can help answer this question.
A PhD dissertation was published in 2017, which looked at optimizing various parts of an x86 processor, one of which being the front-end decoders. For this optimization, several billion instructions from various benchmarks were analyzed to determine the frequency of prefix bytes and total instruction length. For prefix bytes, 86% of the instructions in the benchmarks contained no prefix bytes, and only 14% included one prefix byte. This suggests that the performance penalty of one prefix byte per cycle of the original Pentium would have a minor, but still relevant impact. It should be noted that the escape byte 0F was included as a prefix, which is typically included as part of the opcode. This was an optimization later introduced by the Pentium MMX, which has the effect of significantly reducing the prefix decode penalty. Aside from the prefix frequency, the dissertation also looked at the frequency of instruction lengths. We can see that the bulk of the instructions are between 2 and 3 bytes in length, with very few being 1 byte. This suggests that the guess of 1 byte opcodes by the Pentium resulted in a significant performance hit. It should be noted, however, that many of the benchmarks used to collect this data came from programs written a decade after the original Pentium was released. So they may not properly reflect the statistics at the time, leading to more pessimistic performance conclusions. That being said, I did leave out one important detail, which helped negate the disparity between the one-byte guess and the instruction statistics. In one of the Pentium documents, it was implied that a length caching mechanism was used to help mitigate the incorrect guess penalty. I haven't been able to find any more detail about how this was implemented, but I can speculate. Likely, a small length cache buffer was used, similar to what you would expect from a branch predictor. This length cache buffer would have likely been relatively small, and consisted of a program counter tag in addition to the calculated instruction length. Each cycle, the decode program counter would be used to index into the length cache, if the tag for that entry was a match for the decode program counter, then the cache length would be used. If the tag did not match, then the guess of one byte would be used instead. The implication here, is that this length caching is really only useful for instruction loops, where the first loop results in one instruction per cycle, and subsequent passes can improve upon this once the length cache has been primed. Nevertheless, this is the same problem faced with normal caches and branch prediction, although to a lesser degree. To bring everything so far together, let's look at the block diagram of the original Pentium processor. Here, I have annotated the pipeline stages to show how the different blocks map to each stage. The original Pentium had five stages, which were the fetch, decode 1, decode 2, execute, and writeback stages. Although I have the writeback stage shown covering the data cache, the data cache was written during the execute stage, with the writeback really only applying to the register files. Also, the stages are not aligned with the floating point unit blocks, since that part of the diagram is not as easily divided. Out of all of the blocks, this video has only been focusing on part of the front end. The front end and the area of focus have been annotated. Note, I have been ignoring the branch prediction hardware and the microcode ROM, marked as control ROM, since it's not as relevant to the issue of length decoding. It would be nice if we could see more detail, but this diagram is quite sparse in the area of interest. Now that the bigger picture has been established, we can look at a more detailed diagram. This is not an official diagram, but it likely reflects the actual implementation or something close to it. Some signals, checks, and controls are omitted due to space constraints. Additionally, the branch prediction and microcode components and their associated signals are also omitted. Like the 386 and 486 that came before it, the Pentium used a prefetch buffer to store the current instruction byte stream. This byte stream was then connected to two byte rotators, one for the U and V pipelines, respectively. These rotators behave similar to bit rotators, except they act on full byte quantities instead of bits, allowing for the decoders to address the next byte to decode from the prefetch buffer. The U and V rotators then went directly into the first stage, U and V decoders. In the following cycle, the instruction would enter the second stage U and V decoders. Here, the decoders were split into two stages to reduce the critical path and to allow for early hazard checking. Once an instruction has been written to the register between the decode one and two stages, it cannot change pipelines. Furthermore, there are restrictions as to which instructions can be executed in the two pipelines since they are not symmetric. As a consequence, it's necessary to determine the parability before the decode program counter is updated. Luckily, the parability can be done quicker than a full instruction decode, which may need to break the instruction into smaller operations or microops. In parallel to the first stage decoders, the length of U and V instructions are also calculated from the output of the rotators. Note that the U length calculator does a full length calculation, while the V length calculator does a simple length calculation. The reason for the disparity is again due to a restriction in which instructions can execute in the V-pipeline. If an instruction cannot be committed to the V-pipeline, then the length calculator need not figure out the instruction's actual length.
In the case of such an instruction, nothing is committed to the V pipeline, and instead the length obtained from the U length calculator is used for the next decode program counter. As a result, the length calculator for the V pipeline can be simpler. Similarly, the V pipeline decoders are also simpler than their U counterparts. This is also advantageous at a circuit level, due to the longer critical path for the V pipeline caused by the additional V rotator control circuitry. A few additional notes, while not relevant to the video topic, I should address them. The instruction cache on the original Pentium could fetch 32 bytes per cycle, and were written into 32 byte queues. The queue itself likely did not take all 32 bytes at once though, and instead used a sub queue write back strategy. This technique is mentioned in one of the AMD K6 patents, and requires precise logic to coordinate. In the ideal case, this allows for the prefetch buffers to always contain valid instruction bytes, even when instructions cross the buffer boundary. Additionally, the original Pentium had two of such prefetch queues, which were used to mitigate the fetch penalty of a mispredicted branch. Essentially, when a branch taken prediction is made, the active prefetch buffer flips, filling the previously inactive buffer. If the branch is then evaluated to not taken, in the execution stage, then the prefetch buffer is flipped back to the previous one, allowing for the stream to continue where it left off. There are many diagrams which incorrectly depict this, and instead suggest that there is one buffer per pipeline, which is incorrect. The output of the prefetch buffers could be 32 bytes, resulting in 32 byte rotators, or could be 16 bytes like later front ends. This detail is not known and really doesn't bear much relevance other than circuit complexity and potential added transistor delay. The rotators themselves, however, likely only output 7 bytes, which fed directly into the decoders. This may seem counterintuitive given that an instruction can be up to 15 bytes in length. However, out of those 15 bytes, only 12 of those bytes can belong to the actual instruction, assuming a 2 byte opcode. For 3 byte opcodes, it would go up to 13 bytes, etc. 7 plus 7 gives you a total of 14 bytes, which is enough to cover the maximum length of an instruction once the prefix bytes are removed. A further restriction is that only one instruction longer than 7 bytes can be decoded per cycle. If only one instruction that length can be decoded per cycle, then that means the V pipeline instruction buffer will be in used, so you might as well use that to store the additional bytes. And finally, a reminder that the length calculators only require the first three bytes to perform any calculation, so those buses can be smaller too. Now that we have a better diagram of the front end, let's look at it from the perspective of general performance techniques. Let's go in reverse order since that's the clearest. We already established that the front end performs length guessing by utilizing the length cache. If the length cache is a miss, then it has to fall back to a default value. So this technique is used. That default value is a one byte instruction length, which is also a heuristic approximation. So this technique is also used. Because of the complexity of the length calculation and pair checking, we need to not only compute the two lengths in parallel, but also the stage one decoding in parallel with the length calculation. So the method of parallel computation is also used. It was previously established that the U and V decoders have been split up into two stages to reduce the critical path, and that the stage one decoder is necessary to ensure that an executable instructions do not get committed to the wrong pipeline. Essentially, this task was moved from the decode two stage earlier into the decode one stage. So that counts as early computation, meaning this method was also used. And finally, because of the nature of the length cache, we can claim pre-computation. The length of a given instruction was ideally pre-computed in a previous cycle, thus removing the computation out of the critical path. So that method was used as well. There's still more to cover regarding x86 front ends and length decoding, but this video is already getting long. Given the complexity of the other processors I want to cover, they may have to be their own videos. The next would be the Pentium MMX, followed by the K6 and P6 together, and finally the K7. Given that they will be a direct continuation however, I don't think this will classify as a series. Anyway, I hope this helped demonstrate the complexities introduced by the variable length nature of x86 instructions, and how an early architecture design was implemented to help circumvent those complexities. Until next time, thanks for watching.